But despite these challenges, we need to move forward and adapt to the new normal. It is in this light that we at the PSM National Board have decided to bring to you this webinar entitled Microbiology from Concepts to Applications Towards Sustainable Development, which was originally our Cluster 2 Symposium theme. <clears throat> at this point, allow me to read the message Sir Al prepared and would have delivered during the Cluster 2 Symposium at the De La Salle University in Manila. The message reads, Together with the Board of Directors of the Philippine Society for Microbiology, I welcome all our members, esteemed guests, participants, sponsors, and partners to this event. With the theme, Microbiology from Concepts to Applications Towards Sustainable Development, our organizers have worked hard to invite speakers who are experts in their field of education, research, and community extension to emphasize the role of microbiology and its allied fields in improving the lives of the people. This would have been fitting introduction to our much anticipated 49th annual convention and scientific meeting, which unfortunately, as I've said earlier, was also canceled due to the pandemic. This year's theme was Kawingan, PSM creating linkages for achieving the UN SDGs. To show our last respect to Sir Al, we at the PSM board are also looking at the possibility of at least adapting or incorporating part of this theme in our 50th annual convention. I would like to thank the organizers, specifically Mr. Christian Jordan O. De La Rosa, which was the head of cluster two, and also the head of this webinar, Dr. Lucille Villegas, Dr. Noel Sabino, and of course, Mr. Robbie Vasquez, for making sure that today's program will be filled with learning and meaningful discussions about the role of microbiology and, it, and its allied fields in ensuring a sustainable future for everyone. I enjoin our participants to take this opportunity to contribute <clears throat> and make the most of our activities. I would like to extend also our gratitude to the biology department of the De La Salle University which was originally our host for the Cluster 2 Symposium. We would like to thank them because we have already made the preparations for the Cluster 2, the venue, the parking, even the catering and the um, souvenir program. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to cancel it because of the limitations of mass gathering. We would also like <clears throat> to thank our sponsors, particularly Procter and Gamble for making this event possible. I'm happy to announce that we have moved, extended our partnership with Procter and Gamble. We are not only now into uh, <clears throat> dishwashing detergent, we have also extended our partnership with the laundry uh, detergent. And also I'm very happy to announce that based on certain studies, that was done in Japan, Joy can effectively, is very effective as a sur surface disinfectant that can reduce viral count. I would also like to thank ESCO Philippines, which is also play, uh, is playing a vital role during this pandemic by providing biosafety cabinets to protect our frontliners. And of course, another partner of ours, the 3M, which are also providing protective materials such as masks to majority of the general population. In fact, I think tomorrow we have speaker from 3M in this particular webinar, okay? These partners have been with us to thick and thin, making all these activities possible. As we move forward, we expect new partners in our PSM family. On a personal note, we at PSM are committed to bring to you our mandate being an organization that aims to promote scientific knowledge in the field of microbiology and other related fields. So please expect more webinars to come, probably on our cluster symposia, and hopefully 
if the situation will already normalize by next year, I am personally inviting you to our 50th annual convention and scientific meeting. With that, I would like to greet everyone. A wonderful morning. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Stay safe and healthy at mabuhay po tayong lahat. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Joel Cruz, <coughs> for PSM president. And I agree this uh, webinar <coughs> dedicated to Sir Al. So before we begin our uh, webinar today, <coughs> just a reminder to keep your devices on mute. Also, if you don't have to, please turn off your video. And we're currently live in uh, YouTube. So if you, if you know someone who wants to join, uh, please tell them, go to our YouTube uh, channel. Okay, so without uh, further ado, let's start with our first speaker for today. Our first speaker currently works as a university research and project leader at National Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology, or Biotech in UPLB. She is an affiliate associate professor at the Institute of Biological Sciences and an affiliate assistant professor in Agricultural Systems Institute, also in UPLB. She earned her bachelor's degree in agriculture, major in soil science, her master's degree, major in microbiology, and her doctorate in microbiology at UPLB. For her postdoctorate, she went to the Ohio State University in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio, USA. She has published numerous papers in scientific journals. She has contributed six publications as book chapters, the latest of which involved her work in screening, identifying, and optimizing isolated uh, extracellular uh, lipase production of yeast, Cryptococcus flavicens, isolated from a tree canopy in Mount Makiling Forest Reserve. She also completed five externally funded projects, among which Could you try again? Uh, she co-developed the Mycoplast biofertilizer. Currently, she is working on the isolation of beneficial microorganisms for enhanced growth of crops. Everyone, please welcome our first speaker for today, uh, Dr. Jocelyn T. Sarate. Uh, hello, good morning. Good morning, ma'am. We can hear you loud and clear. Uh, I'm trying to share my... Uh, I would like to thank ESM and its board of members for letting me speak about my favorite topic. Uh, I hope uh, you will get something out of this talk. So let me start. Uh, harnessing beneficial microorganisms as biofertilizers for sustainable development. Um, the current scenario in the Philippines is that Filipinos are increasing in number, starting in 2005 with 85 million, and then in 2015, over 100 million, and currently now over 109 million. According to age group, majority are between the ages of 5 to 24 years old. These are young group, and we have a decreasing percentage of elder people. This means we need more food, and we need more food producers. We need technologies that can enhance agricultural productivity, as well as safe effective farming methods to, to, to help men and the environment. Um, in, enhancing agricultural pro productivity means improving soil fertility. Soil fertility as defined by FAO 
is the ability of the soil to sustain plant growth and optimize crop yield. This can be enhanced through application of organic and inorganic fertilizers. You are seeing a typical land preparation scenario. Look at the field. It is heavily prepared, all organic matter removed and passed through heavy equipment. This has been our manner of production ever since and our farmers have relied on chemical inputs but this encourages the death or the lower population of nitrogen fixtures. And there is depletion of organic matter wherein organic matter is the source of nutrients. With decreasing population of microbes, there is less mucilaginous secretions, thereby leading to less soil aggregation and destruction of soil structure. The government has been making ways on how to improve soil fertility. In 2010, organic agriculture was um, promoted, meaning we develop ways on how to encourage putting more organic matter into the soil. It has many implementing rules and regulation as mandated by the organic agriculture program with certain board and technical working group and certification system. However, 10 years from then, we are seeing many challenges. There is a high cost of compliance to the standards borne by the farmer and these costs are not good to consistently go into organic. And then we need to encourage more organic agri practitioners on the national level. The current DA secretary, Secretary William Gar, said during the National Organic Agriculture Conference last August, he said that he's not against organic agriculture, but proposes balanced fertilization. Balanced fertilization ensures reduced use of chemical inputs and use of integrated farming practices that maximizes crop production and protects the soil. It also uses organic farming practices. This is a very busy slide, but if you go with me, I will show you how chemical fertilizer application can be reduced and its losses can be minimized through proper soil and crop management. How? Through erosion control, through crop, proper cropping practices, and use of proper cultivars and weed control. Losses of chemicals can be reduced by proper fertilizer management, by applying at the proper time and rate, using correct formulation and proper placement. Recycling of nutrients can be done through mulching farming, wherein crop residues and organic waste are incorporated into the soil. And we also practice agroforestry, such as alley cropping to, pro to prevent soil erosion and other systems. But then we have to pattern it, partner it with organic fertilizers with the use of biofertilizers, compost, and plant supplements, which include fermented plant juice, fermented fruit juice, oriental herb nutrient, vermity, humic acid, wood vinegar, and others. This part is composed of beneficial microorganisms. Beneficial microorganisms can be categorized into three biofertilizers, which are microbial inoculants with live or latent cells, meaning sleeping cells, providing nutrients to crop. This includes nitrogen fixer, P, phosphorus and potassium solubilizers, cellulose degraders. Second are biostimulants. 
They provide organic substances, enhancing growth and development when applied in small quantities. They secrete auxins, cytokinins, and giverylins. Third type are the biopesticides, which natural secretes naturally occurring substances and microbials that can reduce the population of insect pests and pathogens. So here we have the antibiotic secreting microbes and those with antagonistic effects. In balanced fertilization or enhancing crop productivity, we always wishes to have healthy soil. So what is a soil? Soil cons consists of air, water, minerals, and organic material. There is 25% air, 25% water, we had 45% mineral particles. But then this mineral particles, it has 3% humus, 1% roots, and 1% organisms. The organisms make the soil alive. And they are part of the soil food web that help decomposers work on the photosynthesizers so that we can move the soil across other microorganisms and macroorganisms. Simply to understand beneficial organisms, let us consider it as a race on which plant will reach the finish line. So if you have, if you were given the same number of microorganisms, the winner, the, the plant that will have the best plant growth is the one which have microorganisms helping it for faster growth as compared to a plant which majority are just relying on its photosynthesis and not helping it to grow. So at Biotech Upilus Banyos, for more than 40 years, we have been developing biofertilizer products and the latest of which is called Mycoplast. The main purpose of using biofertilizers is to increase the number of beneficial microorganisms and accelerate certain microbial processes that increase the availability of nutrients to the plants. Let us review what are these nutrients that will help plant grow. So correct those that are needed in large amounts, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, in macro amounts, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. In micro amounts are iron, zinc, copper, boron, manganese, silicon, molybdenum, sodium, cobalt, and perine. All these 16 elements are needed by the plants for it to grow and provide yield. Beneficial microorganisms Engage, engage in many processes related to nutrient cycling. So number one, for nutrient transformation, we have nitrogen fixers, phosphorus solubilizers, potassium solubilizers. Number two, organic matter decomposition. So let's start with nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen is present in the atmosphere as N2, which is covalently bonded with three covalent bonds. The process to make ammonia is called Haber-Bosch process, and it requires this chemical equation. To do this, you need a temperature of 600 degrees centigrade and a pressure of, above, of about 200 atmosphere. For us to relate to this, the normal pressure is one atmosphere and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade. Hence, we can always view chemical factories as view as factories secreting or releasing mist or steam. In comparison, 
biological nitrogen fixation also starts with N2, and this is conducted by free leaving a symbiotic, such as cyanobacteria and azotobacter. Number two, by associative rhizosphere and azospirillium, or lichens and cyanobacteria. Or number three, by symbiotic association, which is the most famous as the legion rhizobium symbiosis, as can be observed in nodules. The chemical equation are as shown, is as shown below. N2 plus six hydrogen plus six electrons in the, in the presence of nitrogenase enzyme produces two molecules of ammonia. This reaction is also energy intensive, but all the energy required is exerted by the microbes and it takes place at ambient or normal temperature and pressure. There are many other biological nitrogen fixers. Shown here are cyanobacteria, the blue green algae nostoc. In the presence of heterocyst, it can fix nitrogen. And the second is the azola anabina, the freshwater fern, blue green algae. And then the actinorhizophrankia in the trees. This table summarizes the other free living Arob, Azotobacter, Rebshela, Bencarinca, Cyanobacteria, the anaerobic microbes consisting of the Strigium, the Sulfur Vibrio, Purple Sulfur Bacteria, Purple Non Sulfur Bacteria, the Green Sulfur Bacteria. And in symbiotic relationship with plants, we have the legumes, Rhizobium, and others. The nitrogen fixation is just a small part of the nitrogen cycle, wherein nitrogen is fixed in the nodules of plants or in free living microbes to produce ammonia. But then ammonia is also produced by ammonification when decomposers work on the urine and feces of animals and their waste. Ammonia can be transformed to nitrate by nitrification by the action of nitrifying bacteria. Nitrate is the form assimilated by plant roots, hence it's in large quantity. But then if in proper placement, this can be denitrified to nitrogen gas again with the action of the nitrifying bacteria. How much nitrogen is produced by biological and to fixation? I summarize here three authors. First one is by Harridge et al. in 2008. They use the total nitrogen balancing method, present nitrogen derived from atmosphere using N15. According to their paper on a global scale, the food legumes contribute 21.45 teragram nitrogen per one TG is equals to 1 million tons. And the highest of this is by soybeans, probably due to high hectare of plantation. Another author, Salvagiotti et al. in 2008, using meta-analysis of 637 data sets, comparing site, year, and treatment combinations, the results showed biological nitrogen fixation can contribute from 0 to 337 kilograms N per hectare, or 58% nitrogen. Ladha et al. in 2016, using a top-down global nitrogen budget for maize, rice, and wheat for a 50-year period, showed that cereals harvested 15, 1,551 teragram, or 48% supplied by chemical fertilizer, 4% from net soil depletion, and 48% from other sources, where biological nitrogen fixation gave 25%, or 370 PGN. The second Beneficial, the group, second group of beneficial microorganisms are the phosphorus 
cellulizing microorganisms. So phosphorus is very important in plant growth. PSMs are, are beneficial microorganisms that hydrolyze insoluble P to soluble P so that it can be assimilated by plants. This figure shows uh, the availability of nutrients from low pH to high pH. The thinner the band shows small amount of phosphorus, but high concentration of iron, manganese, and zinc. And this pH of three and four, there is high concentration of iron phosphate, manganese phosphate, and zinc phosphates. On the other hand, on the other part of the soil pH, at high pH, calcium, potassium, and magnesium is in high amounts, hence complexes of calcium phosphate and magnesium phosphates are available. Hence, we need phosphate solubilizing microorganisms to release phosphorus to the plant. In the laboratory, we screen for phosphate solubilizing microorganisms using media with calcium triphosphate. And we, when we observe clearing zones around colonies, this indicates that phosphorus has been solubilized so that it can be used by the microbes. Another organism for phosphate solubilization is by mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is a Greek term coming from mics, meaning fungus, and risa for roots. This is a highly interdependent mutualistic relationship whereby the fung fungi gets the photosynthesis and uses the carbohydrates. The roots, on the other hand, receive the mineral nutrients by having root extenders. So there are two common types of mycorrhiza. I will just mention two because there are more than seven types of mycorrhiza. Number one is the ecto, meaning outside, and number two are the endo, meaning inside. Ecto mycorrhiza belong to the ascomycetes and the basidiomycetes, the higher fungi. They are the mushrooms and the puckballs type. Puckballs, when they mature, they release talcum-like powder spores, hence they're called popples. They are uh, found in three species, some, such as pine trees, the pericarps, and eucalypts. So our collection sites are the Benguet pine plantation. On the other hand, the endomycorrhiza belong to the lower fungi or the zygomycetes. It is composed of a spore wall with a very long hyphae thread. It can be available, some are in singular and some are in clusters. This endomycorrhizal association is observed in agricultural crops, fruit and forest trees. The most important way to determine if it's ecto and endo is by root infection appearance. In ectomycorrhiza, the hyphae are very visible like hairy root or masses of mycelia covering the root tips. There is also root deformation. On the other hand, for endomycorrhiza, we need a microscope and we need to stain the roots so that we can see the hyphae and the vesicles. These vesicles or oblong-like structures in the roots are the food storage organs. In the in a needle, in a sewing needle, I can put as much as 50 spores of endomycorrhiza. So you can just imagine how small they are. The better growth of endomycorrhiza applied crops was observed on the phosphorus deficient soil. During my master's thesis, I got to appreciate them more while working on a phosphorus deficient soil belonging to the Anum series with a pH of four and reddish brown. 
it was collected in Nueva Ecija. We were working on teaching the people agroforestry by planting agri-crops and forest trees. But we observed that without application and inoculation and just chemical fertilizer at the rate of 60, 60, 60 kilograms NPK per hectare, the plants did not grow. But if we applied different species of endomycorrhiza, such as Glomus etonicatum, Glomus macrocarpum, or Gigaspora margarita, the plant was able to use up the chemical fertilizer supply. This was the same result as when we use peanut as sauce plant or papaya and acacia mangium as sauce plant. Meaning to say the nutrients in the acidic and phosphorus deficient soil were used up by the plant and the plant grew because of this endomycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza performed this action. So from a single spore, it associates with the roots of plants. And if we look closely, it penetrates the root. So we need to stain using triton blue so we can get a view of the internal hyphae. And they, after one month, the fungi are able to complete their life cycle in the formation of a new spore and the presence of many external hyphae. This fungal hyphae serves as additional roots for greater nutrient and water absorption, even up to three to five meters away. So mycorrhiza also functions as phosphorus and potassium solubilizers. They secrete growth hormones and they also protect plants roots from soil pathogens, and they enhance crop tolerance to drought. For many years, we have developed many mycorrhizal inoculants. We have the vegetative mycelia, as, which is similar to a tissue culture where we grow the fungal, the fungi, and we inoculated with small, this small eucalyptus seedlings. Here, the microgrove was collected from the talcum spores from the pop balls, and each tablet can be inoculated to a seedling. The endomycorrhizal inoculants consist of the microbam, bam root inoculants, and mycoplasts. There are many other phosphate solubilizing microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, mycorrhiza, and actinomycetes. Moving on, potassium solubilization. Potassium solubilizers are next. They are also called KSMS. They are rhizosperic, are living in the rhizosphere of, of plants that solubilize insoluble potassium to soluble forms. Many potassium containing minerals include muscovite, orthopase, biotite, feldspar, and mica. So some of these KSMS include Bacillus mucilaginus, Bacillus sudaficus, Bacillus circulans, Pahemi Bacillus aspergillus, actinomycetes, and others. In the laboratory, detection of potassium solubilizers are done using Alexandra agarmitrum, as shown in letter A. But then, with the infusion of bromtimo blue, we can easily detect the positive PKSMS. The presence of enhanced level of carbon and its reaction with water produces carbonic acid, which causes the blue coloration in the medium. This slide by Satar et al. in 2019 shows how the soil potassium, which is chelated into these minerals, are released into the soil 
through the action of bacteria, fungi, and mycorrhiza, there is first a lowering of pH or acidosis. So from chelation, they get this, so this solution and so are released into the root environment on the root soil sol solution. Moving on, organic matter decomposition. This consists of compost and fermented concoctions. Microbial communities undergo organic matter decomposition. So from complex polymers, example, cellulose, lignin, protein, and through the release of extracellular enzymes, they are converted to monomeric units, such as sugars, phenols, and amino acids. In the process of this decomposition, in the presence of oxygen, the process become aerobic and the products are carbon dioxide, water, more energy, and more cell biomass. However, in the presence or in the absence of oxygen and anaerobic process, we have a fermentation, such as that in fermented fruit juice, fermented plant juice, and fish amino acid. The products are carbon dioxide, methane, alcohols, organic acids, ammonia, and we have less energy and less biomass. Moving on, beneficial microorganisms also secrete plant growth regulators or hormones. So for example, auxins, they stimulate cells to elongate. So these are found in their shoot and root Uverilins, they enhance germination, also stem elongation, flower and fruit set. Cytokinins increase cell division through mitosis leading to plant growth, shoots and buds, and the development of fruits and seeds. Okay, please bear with me as I show how microorganisms can control cell cycle. Uh, from the root zone, there are many microorganisms and they secrete an effect on the roots. However, if we add biofertilizers that are secreting large amount of plant hormones, they affect or attaches to the roots of the plant, leading to root development and elongation. Some of these uh, some of these, some of these uh, growth hormones are directed to the apical meristem that controls the cell cycle. So the cell cycle, as shown, we have G1, the pre-synthesis, DNA synthesis, G2 post synthesis and M mitosis. So in the presence of these giverilins and toxins, the cell cycle continued, hence we have a continuous growth of the plant. And G0 cell cycle exit is not implemented. There are many other bio beneficial microorganisms and these beneficial microorganisms exist together in the soil making the soil alive and healthy. Let me see uh, how are biofertilizers applied. So first we can coat them, such as this corn. We can also coat tubers or planting materials. We can soak the seeds, or we can put them in germination boxes. This, uh, application has been done using mycoplasts and we have seen grain yield increases. For example, in cassava, in two barangays in Sariaya, Quezon, application of mycoplasts plus the farmer's practice gave a 40% up to a 74% in tuber yield. In legume experiment at the BP Islas Banos, legumes such as mung bean, 
being 27% increase in grain yield, helping 50% and soybean 103% in yield. Soil properties are also affected. So before, soil pH was 5.63. After the cropping season, like for example, corn, pH dropped. But those with mycoplasts or biofertilizers were less acidic. And also residual nitrogen was also higher. So before the cropping season, there was 0.97%, but with fertilizer application and my biofertilizer application, residual soil N increased. However, in the presence of biofertilizers, there were higher values compared to those with A without. So as my take home message, beneficial microorganisms can really promote germination. They assist in greater water and nutrient uptake. They stimulate routine flowering and food set, secrete mucilaginous substances for soil aggregation and build up of soil structure. Overall, they enhance yield. Hence, these beneficial microorganisms exist together in the soil, making the soil alive and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Jocelyn Sarate. Uh, for our participants, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to put it in our chat box. For everyone in our YouTube channel, you can also put uh, your questions down at the comment section. Okay, so we will move on uh, to our next speaker for today. But before that, some announcement. Okay, so uh, this uh, webinar would not be possible without our uh, major partners. We would like to thank uh, PNG for an ending support to PSM. We would also like to thank ESCO and 3M, our uh, partners. Okay, so our next speaker Our next speaker for today is currently a professor emeritus and curator at the National Museum of Natural History in UPLB. She has worked tirelessly in the field of science with numerous published scientific papers and research projects under her name. She earned her bachelor's degree in botany at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, her master's degree in botany focusing on algal physiology at the University of Maryland in USA. For her doctorate degree, she went back to the Philippines under a National Science Development Board scholarship and took up botany at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. From 2013 to date, she has, she has had 10 completed research projects has authored and co-authored books, has written several papers, nine of which focusing on diatoms. She has conducted several trainings, workshops, and has presented numerous uh, papers in national and international uh, symposia, most of which receive awards. She is also active in extension projects in and out of the university. Our speaker is a multi-awarded scientist, having been, having been awarded the Pillars of PPSI Award by the Philippine Phycological Society Incorporated and the Freshwater Taxonomist Award. So everyone, please welcome our next speaker, Professor Emeritus Dr. Milagrosa R. Martinez Goss. Professor Goss? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. This morning, I'm going to tell you a story on how algae, both micro and macroalgae, can contribute 
in fighting malnutrition, alleviate poverty, and decrease global warming. The first problem, high incidence of malnutrition in the Philippines. Malnutrition is defined as uh, deficiencies or excesses or imbalance in a person's intake of energy or nutrient. In this paper, we are going to refer more to undernutrition. Did you know that in the Philippines, in, in, um, there are about 32% or 4 million people that are underweight among preschool population. This was in 2001. And um, this is really very, very alarming, which means 4 million are underweight among the preschool people. So what could be a one solution to this problem, the algae? Okay, of the about 30,000 to 1 million algal species that have been accounted, about 100 species are used as indigenous food in the country. Among these, the most popular are the marine algae that are the, uh, the ones that we eat most are the red and the green algae. The least popular one is, belongs to the freshwater alga, the cyanobacterium which is your nostoc commune, a nitrogen fixing alga, which is non-branching filamentous alga that aggregates its filaments in, to form a colony surrounded by gelatinous sheet. This is known in Lucano as sabtaba or bolbojo. This has, uh, is a very popular food that is eaten as a salad uh, combined with some dishes. Um, the popularity probably is more because of its gelatinous texture or jelly-like texture due to the high amount of dietary fiber in it, which can be as much as 0.45 grams per gram dry weight. Although the crude protein is as much as 52% of the total dry weight of the organism. And the most popular among the marine algae that are being eaten in the Philippines, of course, you know, Arorosep or Lato, Kaulerpa. We have Kapapaikus or Gracilaria or Guso. And of course, we have the uh, Gracilaria or Gulaman that we call. Didn't you know that among these groups of algae, the one that gives us um, the high amount of protein still belongs to your uh, Nostoc Komuk commune which in the field could have as much as 28%, but if you culture it, could get as high as 52%. The one that uh, has a very high amount of fat content belong, belongs to the brown algae, which is about 1.05% of the total dry matter, and the carbohydrates belong to the, again, the cyanobacteria because of the galactans in their cell wall, and also among the red algae, it is the manans in your cell wall also, or your source of carrageenan, or and also your agar. The algae, some of these algae are also good sources of vitamins. Uh, okay, the red algae are good sources of beta carotene, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin. And the one that gives us a great amount of ascorbic acid belongs to the brown algae. They are also good sources of iron. The brown algae are good sources of uh, iron. And the ones that um, we eat most are your sargassum in its young states. We call them in our dialect Aragon. And the good source of iodine belongs to the green algae. And we have some amount high incidence of goiter in the Philippines. And uh, there are so, some non-conventional algal food that we also know. We, we know chlorella could have as much as 52% uh, crude protein and we know the chlorella growth factor a green alga called Dunaliella has a high amount of crude protein also, but the highest amount of crude protein can be found in spirulina, a cyanobacterium, which can be as much as 70% of its total body weight. 
Nostoc Comune could be under cultural condition could be as much as 53%. And we know that in dairy products, we can only about have 3.5% crude protein. Our meat products about 34%. Uh, and the highest uh, crude protein that we can have from our conventional food products will be from soybean. That is the spirulina, a cyanobacterium, and this is Dunaliella. Dunaliella in its vegetative state, and it, in its uh, akinet form, you have to uh, induce it to form akinet to produce more carotenoid, which can be as much as 14% of its total dry matter. And this is a precursor of your beta carotene. They, in, um, they have been uh, exporting this as beta carotene, and they say that three tablets of your one tablet of this uh, beta carotene is equivalent to eating one carrot. Aside from that, you also get to enhance the color of your feces if you feed them with some beta carotene, and it improves also the color of your meat products. This is chlorella fed uh, meat chicken, and this is non chlorella fed chicken. And also another green alga that is also a popular food and feed now is your uh, freshwater green alga hematococcus pluvialis. This is how it looks like in its freshwater form. And if you induce it to form akinet, you will have a lot of it made up of astaxanthin, an antioxidant. As much as 5% of its total dry, dry weight, dry matter is, is Astaxanthin. Recommendation, but how many of us are aware of all these algal food sources that could be a source of your go, grow, glow food? So probably more education should be given, greater awareness of some algal food that will help us alleviate um, malnutrition. Second problem, poverty. Poverty is defined as where household income is below a necessary level to maintain basic living standards for food, clothing, and shelter. In 2018, the Philippine Statistical Board says our threshold poverty level is about 10,481 pesos per month for a family of five to meet food and non-food needs. Did you know that in 2014, the Philippines has the highest poverty incidence, about 25% among the ASEAN countries. What are some of the causes of poverty in the Philippines? Low income economic growth, these are some that I will just present. Increased population growth, high volume of inequality, weak agricultural sector. The RG probably could answer of the, all of those, but I would like to just discuss the weak agricultural sector. Because in the agricultural sector, we have the fishery sector. Under the fishery, we have the seaweed and the microalgae industry. In fact, when you go to the fish market, the wet market, you will find seaweeds being sold in the fish section, not in the meat section. Okay, from 2000 to 2015, about 50% of our aquaculture production comes from seaweed. This is in Philippine pesos. So this is the total fishery production. 50% of that is coming from seaweeds. Uh, microalgal companies have been established in the Philippines, but they do not yet make as much money as this seaweed industry. And most of them are just producing spirulina and they are mostly family oriented and they're not as open as the seaweed industry in their, in their um, div divulging their, uh, their income. You know, this is one of the race waste bands of spirulina in Geofarm in Bayambang, Pangasinan. Probably you know the lady there who is trying to um, take part in moving this raceway pan. Okay, now how much marine resources do we have 
uh, that we are farming in the Philippines. We are farming not as much as we should be doing. Um, for example, here, uh, 60,000 hectares are only being farmed. We still have 700,000 hectares that need to be farmed along 200 from the coastline, from the deep sea, about 500,000 hectares. Okay, most of the farm seaweed farming is being done in areas that are very fertile like Palawan, Bohol and Cebu and in Sulu areas. And why, are, why is there such a clamor for growing seaweeds like Kapapaikos and Yokuma? Mainly because of the carotenoid that you'll get from its cell wall a carbohydrate material that is used as an emulsifying agent that you see its product in your toothpaste, beauty products, and in your ice cream, and in your meat products, even in your encapsulating your medicine so that they do not harden, they do not become so gooey, they are just in right consistency because of carotenoid. Okay, let's look at the seaweed farming in the Philippines. The cultivation period is between February to October, nine months. Cultivation one cycle is about 45 days. The total harvest they can get within a year is three to four. And the type of cultivation that they have is a monoline method. The maximum area that has been farmed by a family or so is about one fourth of a hectare or 2,500 square meter, not one hectare. So far, the maximum number of families involved in seaweed farming are 200,000. There are usually five members per family. Okay, net income, I will just go very fast on this. The net income see, of the seaweed farmer per family in 2015 was 9,117 per month. This is way above the food threshold and the poverty threshold I, uh, identified by the Philippine Statistical Board. So that is very good result. So recommendations, seaweed farming is profitable and provides more job opportunities. But we need to expand areas for seaweed farming. The government should ensure the peace and order in some places in Mindanao where the farming is more profitable and then the government should provide more training in seaweed cultivation in improving our, our cultivars because most of the time they, it is just a, um, vegetative propagation. So we should do more other techniques. The, the third problem I would like to get involved in is your uh, problem of climate change or global warming. And climate change, of course, is significant change in global temperature, precipitation, wind patterns over several decades or, or longer. I will, I will talk more about global warming, which is a gradual increase in tem overall temperature of the Earth's atmosphere, generally due to greenhouse effect caused by an increased level of CO2 and other pollutants. Okay, we all know that um, the, uh, the CO2 level has been increasing over a thousand years. Right now we have about 400 or more mi micromole of CO2 per mole when we used to have very low amount of in this at this time. Okay. Also in conjunction, hand in hand with this increase in the CO2, there is an increase of global temperature up to about 0.75 degrees. You know, the, during the Second World War, there was also an increase in our global temperature. Now, there are several proofs of global warming. One of them is what I have here. Uh, probably some of you could not associate it with the 18th century, but probably you are more aware of what is happening in the 2000s. Now, one of the solutions to this problem could be the algae. Why? They can photosynthesize. 
bicarbonate, they have a high bicarbonate capturing efficiency as high as 90%, because some of them can be very small, they can cover more surface area, they expose more surface area for photosynthesis. They grow so fast, they're found also in aquatic habitat where aquatic resources are usually more than the land area. Let's look at those one by one. They are photosynthetic organisms, phototrophic. They are carbon dioxide fixers. They are, excuse me, they are also oxygenator of the atmosphere, aside from giving us the organic matter that we need, carbon compounds. The, it has been uh, calculated that about 1.6 to 2.2 grams of CO2 is needed to produce one gram of alcohol biomass. Okay, now CO2 from the atmosphere gets into water. The organisms are usually aquatic and this is compared to carbonic acid. More carbon carbonic acid reacts with carbonate ion in the solution to form bicarbonates. Okay, these are reversible reaction. Now, one thing about the algae is that they have found them, uh, you see the movement of your bicarbonate to into the cell, this is in, in the water, into the cell must be done in act, due to active transport. And you need to have a, you need to have um, your, active, your bicarbonate transport protein. They have so far noted that there are about 10 more bicarbonate transport proteins in diatoms, and they have found as many as 10. See, this is a bicarbonate transport protein. Okay, so you, that bicarbonate enters the cytoplasm and it enters the chloroplast and then the, the bicarbonate goes into your dark, uh, in the stroma of your chloroplast where there is dark fixation. However, your Rubisco enzyme, this bicarbonate to CO2 must be converted, the bicarbonate must be converted, must be converted to CO2 by means of your carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Why you need to convert it to CO2? Because your Rubisco enzyme could not act on your bicarbonate. Instead, it only acts on your CO2, combines with your CO2 to form your post-mobiliceric acid. Then, then, then this goes to your Calvin cycle. That is the importance of having a, a carbonic anhydrase enzyme to convert your bicarbonate to CO2 and so that your Rubisco enzyme can pick up the CO2 to produce your phosphoglyceric acid. Now you can go into your Calvin cycle. This uh, con conversion from bicarbonate to CO2 is usually unidirectional. But the, uh, see you have different carbon uh, bicarbonate transport proteins at different, at different areas. And so far they have identified 10 in certain marine diatoms like Phaeodactylum species. <clears throat> Next, we said that um, they are aquatic organisms and usually uh, these um, algae are found more in aquatic areas. As you will note in the Philippines, there are more hectares, aquatic hectares over terrestrial hectares. Therefore, there will be more algae found in this aquatic habitat. Okay. And the, more, the smaller the organism, the more surface areas it is exposed to your source of carbon. And I just want to point out here, here, um, under oligotropic, picophytoplankton is are smaller. Compare it with your algae that are um, 
phytoplanktonic that are much bigger, there is a greater amount of biomass produced in smaller celled algae compared to larger celled algae. Okay. Next, they are fast growing. Uh, for example, therefore, that depends upon the species, of course, cultural conditions and um, media and everything. For example, they can have, they can double their cells in every two hours, but some of them, like Nostoc Comune, could double only every 15 days. Why is that so? In Nostoc Comune, the entry of the CO2 and your bicarbonates may be hindered by the, a lot of gelatinous shit surrounding the groups of colonies of uh, filaments of nosto. Okay. And therefore, are we going to uh, recommend algal blo blooming, uh, algal bloom in certain places? We have to be very careful also. Microcystis bloom, like in Laguna de Bay and Pandin Lake, they could cause some uh, fish kill, you no? Know? And uh, dinoflagellate bloom cause some of uh, the remit toxins. So we have to be very careful on those, uh, uh, on places and the organisms that we would like to bloom. And so, but a bloom of diatoms have been observed to appear after three weeks of iron fertilization by the research vessel of Polar Stern a research icebreaker of the Alfred Wagner Institute in uh, Bremenhaven, Germany. Um, and this is very good. And I think um, this is what they are recommending among researchers is to do more of ion fertilization in the open ocean. Summary and recommendations. There should be a greater awareness of the wealth of non-conventional food sources from algae sources of protein, carbohydrates, go grow glow foods, vitamins, ion, iodine, and antioxidants. Job opportunities are offered from seaweed farming. We must expand seaweed farming to more areas, improve the peace and order situation, the coastal areas of Mindanao, and improve the seaweed cultivars. And then we must cultivate cultivate beneficial algae in the open ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Emeritus Milagros-Agos. Thank you so much. Okay, so before we proceed with our last speaker for today, um, okay. I should uh, stop sharing. Y yes, ma'am. <laughs> Oh, yes, I know, Melin. Okay. Roby, do I do, do I pin do yes? Yes, please. Yes, for ma'am. Oh, but it is. Oh. Okay, so I think we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Okay, I'm so sorry. I think I'm having uh, difficulties uh, sharing my screen, but uh, yeah, we will proceed with our 
uh, next speaker. But before that, uh, if you have question, please put it in our chat box. For those watching in our YouTube live, please comment. Uh, uh, please put your questions in the comment section. Also, please put your uh, include your institution so we can uh, uh, recognize them. So for our last speaker for today, he is currently a research faculty at the Far Eastern University Institute of Technology, where he teaches uh, thermodynamics, machine design, methods of research, and uh, material science. He previously worked as a project assistant in a research study on microalgae processing, particularly on algal biofuel production. He also worked on, a, on the study life cycle assessment of algal biofuels in the Philippines. He has published and presented numerous papers focused on algal and microalgal biofuels. Currently, he is working, uh, working on earning his PhD degree on mechanical engineering at the De La Salle University. Please welcome our last speaker for today, uh, Engineer Ivan Henderson V. Gue. Engineer Ivan. Okay. Thank you, Sir Robbie. Welcome. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank PSM for giving me the, this opportunity to present my, res my research work. So again, I am Engineer Ivan Gue. I am a PhD candidate of the Lotal University and a research faculty of FU Institute of Technology. I first engaged in microalgal research with my previous boss and my current advisor, Dr. Aristotel Bando of the Lotal University. Our project, funded by USAID, focused on the analysis of microalgae as a potential source of biofuels in the Philippines. In this webinar, I'll present a snippet of that research work we did for the design of an integrated sugarcane microalgal biofuel plant. First off, as described by Dr. Goss, climate change has been among the prevailing urgent challenges of the current and future generation. Climate change, of course, is strongly intertwined with energy production and consumption. The latest report by the International Energy Agency shows a snapshot on how our energy demand contributes to the carbon emission problem, of which the power and transport sectors are among the major emitters of carbon dioxide. Additionally, to meet our current demand and, and future demands, fossil fuel still plays a significant role in the global energy production. Addressing the challenges of the two major sectors and switching our fossil fuel dependence will help alleviate our growing carbon emission problem. Among sir, the solutions, yes. Sir, excuse me. Sir, yes. can we uh, share your presentation slide? I think it's not uh, properly presented, sir. Oh, wait, no. Thank you for sir. Oh yeah. Uh, I think so, sir. Oh yeah. Oh. Right. So again. Okay. Uh, climate change has become an issue for us, for the current and future generation. Among the solutions against carbon emission and fossil fuel dependence, biofuels pose an attractive solution for immediate alleviation. The benefits of this energy source is its potential to become carbon neutral. Because of this advantage, biofuel has been heavily considered among various government organizations, wherein Various action plans have been implemented for the biofuel transition. From its inception, there have been four generations of biofuel. In this graph, 
I've, I'm illustrating here some of the more prominent biomass feedstock and their oil production per hectare. As you can see here, uh, microalgae has become an attractive source due to its high oil yield, surpassing most conventional biomass feedstock. This led to a significant consideration towards microalgae for biofuel production. Among its benefits, microalgae is highly efficient in terms of productivity. Secondly, the versatility of microalgae provides production opportunities of various products, as il illustrated by the earlier presentation of Dr. Goss in terms of um, asacentin. Third, microalgae can be grown in non arable land, therefore, it can be built among various geographical conditions. Lastly, the biomass feedstock can be fed with wastewater for growth, therefore additionally resolving challenges of the wastewater treatment. However, the microalgal bio biofuels faces challenges of commercialization. Among the more uh, prominent challenges are water intensity, energy intensity, and cost intensity. For this webinar, I'll present to you the current endeavors on resolving challenges for cost intensity and our research work in addressing that challenge. The graph here shows the cost per liter of oil of production for the conventional feedstocks against microalgae. Against some of the more prominent conventional feedstocks, oil production from microalgae is significantly larger. It has been reported that microalgal oil costs nearly five times more than that of conventional feedstock. This economic hurdle therefore impedes our commercialization of microalgae biofuel. However, existing research works have aimed to resolve the economic challenges of commercialization. Some have suggested co-production of high value products wherein the profit of co-produced high-valued products will help reverse the operational expense of the biofuel plant. Others have suggested utilization of wastewater and or flue gas. This reduces the raw material consumption of the biofuel plant, thereby also reducing the operational cost. While the others have suggested utilizing existing industrial facilities. This helps omit large initial investment costs. Finally, some research work suggests integrating with other types of systems, with other industrial systems. As microalgae provides a diverse range of products, some, some of it may be used by other systems as raw material, thereby achieving a symbiosis between systems. Our work focused mostly on the last solution, on the integration of the biofuel plant with other industrial systems. In here, I'll be outlining some of the proposed designs on how an integrated system will work. So research works have proposed several designs of integration. Here is a design proposed in expanding the capabilities of a typical microalgal biodiesel plant. The plant has the, has the functionality to be a multi-bioenergy system wherein it produces a diverse range of products of biofuels from your methanol, syngas, biodiesel, and your methane. The design has a potential income of $6 billion per year, producing 1,600 tons of biodiesel per day while consuming 4,788 tons of microalgal biomass per day. The next design is an integration of the biofuel plant with an existing sugarcane mill or as the authors termed it as an ISMB plant, an integrated sugarcane with microalgal biofuel plant. 
This design has significant potential among sugarcane producing countries. The design was actually proposed as an alleviation to the biodiesel needs of Brazil, wherein the integration aims to reduce agricultural waste in the form of bagasse and the carbon emissions of the sugarcane mill. The design was able to reduce the emission by 15% while supplying the sugarcane mill with enough diesel for everyday use, everyday operation, and enough excess biodiesel to be sold to the fuel market. This was further extended by the, uh, by the authors in considering an ethanol plant co-linked with the sugarcane mill. The design has the capacity to produce both prominent forms of biofuels, ethanol and biodiesel, while capturing 64.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide per ton of sugarcane produce, but with an increased investment of 1.8%. Finally, for our work, we aim to resolve issues of technology selection, wherein each process each process in the biofuel plant has an array of possible technologies to choose from, such as in this case, in the cultivation process, we could either choose photobioreactor or open pond. This is also similar to the other processes, such as harvesting and all extraction plus conversion. We aim to determine the optimized design based on technology selection for cultivation, harvesting, and all extraction plus conversion. The performance of the sugarcane mill and ethanol plant was based on the findings of a research group in Brazil, while the performance of the technology for each processes in the microalkyl biodiesel plant was based from the research group of Yale. We then developed a mathematical model aiming to maximize the profit and minimize the carbon footprint of the design. This provides a trade-off scenario where the two criteria are at an opposing relationship, where, in profit, uh, where an increase in profit can lead to an increase in carbon footprint, while a decrease in carbon footprint can lead to a decrease in profit. We considered specific design constraints for this integration. In terms of the capacity of the sugarcane mill, we considered 20,000 kilograms per hour. For the biodiesel plant, we considered 1,300 liters per hour. Additionally, we considered that heat, there is no surplus of heat, and all biomass will be utilized by the system. And as I have stated earlier, only one technological choice is considered per process. This is the mathematical model, uh, but for brevity, I'm not going to dive in here much further. For clarification, this process, you can just uh, contact me or you could raise that in the QA portion. Once we've run the optimization, optimization algorithm, we've obtained the optimized design based on the two criteria profit and emission. We were able to initially attain these two types of design one having minimized CO2 emission, while the other one has maximum net profit. As you can see here, although they are optimized, they are difficult to consider, given that the design on the left is environmentally friendly, but is at a financial loss. On the other hand, the profit on the, of the design on the right is maximized, but emits significant carbon dioxide. As profit and carbon emission is a trade-off in this scenario, we need to determine if there's a design where both criteria can be com compromised. In this graph, uh, the graph here illustrates profit versus emission. We want to have a maximum profit and minimum emission. Thereby, we, we want to have our solution somewhere here, found here, for ideal case. Given that, these two are the are, are optimized designs earlier. These are the limits of our design, minimum emission and maximum profit. We then plotted the different possible designs in between the limit. And I'm illustrating here 
the standalone sugarcane mill, the performance of the standalone sugarcane mill. From here, we found three possible designs, wherein all designs considered open pond for cultivation and filtration for, the, for harvesting. While for, for oil extraction plus conversion, the three technological choices are evident among the three designs. In the first case, um, press plus cost of event plus esterification is considered. The difficulty in this design is to reduce profit margin of the plant. However, this design must be only design capable of attaining zero or negative carbon emission. Meanwhile, for case two, super, supercritical carbon dioxide was considered. Uh, this case has been in between the two polarizing designs. This design is on a balancing act between profit and emissions. Finally, case three selects supercritical methanol, wherein carbon emissions significantly increased at a notable profit margin. The selection of which design to use is, is dependent on the stakeholders, on how they're going to determine which which design best fits the pros and cons. It is up to the stakeholder to determine which design they wish to consider in building the ISMB plan. Now our work and some of the, the previous work has significant potential applications in the Philippines. First, the existing sugarcane industry is already utilized to produce ethanol. Therefore, the, inter the integrated design may be implemented among existing sugarcane mills. Second, diesel is the country's dominant transport fuel. This provides a huge market opportunity among stakeholders. Third, as the current biodiesel production is hampered by old and unproductive trees, con the consideration of algal biodiesel may be necessary to augment our feedstock supply for biodiesel production. In summary, microalgae provides an opportunity of averting our carbon footprint. The current challenges of its commercialization is on the economic cost. Research works have proposed several solutions in resolving this challenge. They proposed several designs on system integration, one of which is sugarcane mill integration. Our work developed a model for optimized design of sugar cane mill integration, of which three possible designs were determined that provides their own pros and cons. Our work can still, is still on a preliminary phase as we can still include the fixed cost of the technologies. The model can also consider local data as our Consideration was based on literature of Brazil and the U and from existing literature. Lastly, the model can also consider additional processes that had yet been otherwise included in the model, such as the co-production of high-value products. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions regarding our work and research endeavors, you may contact me through these following channels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Gray. So if you have questions uh, that you'd like to address to Engineer Gue, you can uh, put it in our chat box. For those who are uh, streaming uh, through uh, via our YouTube channel, you can uh, also put it in our in the comment section. Okay, so before uh, we proceed with the Q&A, uh, uh, we would all, uh, again, would like to thank our uh, partners for this webinar, PNG. We would also like to thank ESCO and 3M. And we also have some announcements uh, regarding PSM uh, TRG. So if you have, uh, if you uh, if you need or need to have details, please go to our uh, website, psm.org.ph. Also some announcements for uh, thesis subsidy grant. Again, if you need details, please go to psm.org.ph. And uh, 
Also, we have SCOTC subsidy grant. Okay. You can uh, contact Professor Melissa Carlos. Also, some announcements from uh, Philippine Academy of Microbiology regarding uh, the examination for registered microbiologists. This is uh, for 2020. This is indefinitely postponed. Also, some announcement for the uh, registered microbiologists without exam, those with PhD in microbiology. So you can uh, contact Pam. And also for the oath taking for this year, please uh, please confirm your attendance. This will be held uh, July 18, 10 a.m. Okay. So for our question and answer, This is, uh, this is for our first speaker, Dr. Jocelyn T. Sarate. Ma'am, Jocelyn? Yes. Okay, our first question uh, from the Zoom chat box is from Lynn Ralos from MSU Jensen. The question is, what is the consistency of performance of formulated biofertilizer in field applications? Okay. There are many types of biofertilizers and depending on the content and the manner of application, the effect of application really varies. But look at this point. If you know the type of microorganism in your biofertilizer, you should know how to make it work. Firstly, if you are Majority of the biofertilizers live in the roots of plants. So you should apply it at the root zone. Many people, for simplicity or for laziness, they just mix it in water and spray. So when you spray biofertilizer, where does it go? In the leaves. But your microbes need to reside in the roots. So this is one just aspect of how biofertilizers do not work because they did not apply it very well. Did I answer it right? Hopefully, hopefully you answered uh, Ms. Rin Ralo's uh, question. Uh, another question for you, uh, Dr. Sarate, coming from Mark Anthony Jose, a graduate student from uh, DLSU. Are formulated biofertilizer a good alternative to organic farming? Uh, to address uh, problems of antibiotic resistant bacteria spread from animal manure. Okay. Animal manure How on? application uh, is, part of, is part of organic farming. But then, um, before you use it, it must be properly decomposed or it has passed through increasing in temperature and then decrease in temperature. By doing this method, you will be able to kill majority of the microorganisms, especially those having the antibiotic resistance. So alam naman, we all know that there is a succession when the composition occurs. So hopefully those with high antibiotic content will be limited or will, will decrease in population. For your information, the Fertilizer and Pesticide Authority is screening products for the presence of these uh, microbes, particularly the, the, the coliforms. So any products being sold in the market with very high coliforms is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So the coliforms also contain the antibiotic resistant genes. Okay. So also, ma'am, we have questions. A uh, question from from YouTube. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is from Lester Anso, BS Biology graduate of uh, Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State College. Uh, how can seaweed? How can seaweed farming help in maintaining? Farming help in maintaining marine and coastal, uh, I think this is not from 
For Ma'am Gosia, yeah, Tayan. Ma'am Gosia, yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, another question. Sorry, Ma'am. Uh, this is from Zoom. Mr. From Mr. Kamar Ameril, UPLB graduate student. May I know the current regulation on the, the use of animal manure as per fertilizer in relation to downsides of raw, raw manure use? Actually, uh, raw, mature, raw manure, particularly those uh, ruminants, are encouraged for vermicomposting or composting as a preliminary, but they must, just like the first question, they must be fully decomposed. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, last question, again from uh, Zoom. Uh, what can you say about hydroponics? Hydroponics is composed of water plus available nutrients. Well, yes, we are able to grow many green leafy vegetables, but then nutrients should be supplied frequently. Uh, there may be microbial population in the hydroponic setup. Well, as long as it produces yield, on a very relative small area, hydroponics is good. But mm -hmm. then nothing is better than planting in soil and maintaining the soil health. You see, ma'am. Okay, so that's all the question, ma'am. Thank you so much for answering. The next question would be for uh, Professor Emeritus Gos. So this is the question from YouTube. Uh, from Lester Anson, BS Biology graduate of Northern Iloilo Polytechnic State College. Um, boss. The question is, how can seaweed farming help in maintaining marine and coastal and, uh, ecosystems? Dr. Goss? Uh, it seems that Dr. Goss, can you hear us? Uh, Mom, you're on mute. Okay, Ayan. can you hear me yes, now? Yes, we can hear you now, ma'am. So, okay. um, seaweed you farming definitely will improve our the environment in our coastal regions because you're going to oxygenate the atmosphere. At the same time, you're going to fix more CO2 from the atmosphere. This will really help a lot aside from helping in giving more job opportunities to the people in the coastal mm. areas. Okay, okay, ma'am, uh, this is another question. This is from our uh, Zoom chat box from Lester, uh, from Lynn Rallos, MSU Jensen. What universities can do uh, to help al algae processing industry for functional food application? Functional food applications. Okay, probably what uh, they can do is tie, uh, the university should tie up with the industry in the local region. I was thinking one of the, the possibility is uh, MMSU in Batak and in La Union. They could um, team up with the uh, local people. There were indigenous Nostok communities growing in the area. They could probably put up a small plant or probably secure the place first so that there will be no intruders in the area and more of the nostock will be growing the place. And then probably the people should be introduced on how they can prepare the food uh, more clean and healthier so that the people will be aware on how to prepare it for food in the area around the place you know this is what i was thinking in la union and in the coastal regions of pilocos there is a lot of uh, nostoc comune and what the people just do is just pick it up from the areas and then just dry it and then sell it without really much doing much um, scientific knowledge actually we learn more about nostoc from the local people we're just bringing science to them now and this is, I hope, what the university could, could do is 
bring science to the local people so that the industry, microalgae industry could thrive very well in that region. Like in Pangasinan and also in Subic where there is spirulina plants, they could probably join with those group of industrial mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. Our next question for, for you, uh, Dr. Goss, is again coming from uh, Ms. Lynn Ralos, MSU Jensen. Uh, what are the negative environmental impacts of commercial aqu aquaculture production and processing? Uh, commercial, can you please repeat? Commercial. The commercial aquaculture production and processing. What are the negative environmental impacts? Oh, I, I uh, probably one, uh, one impact in seaweed industry or in even in algae production, I could not see much of a, a negative impact. What I can see is when they uh, use fishery fish, like in fish cages, wherein they feed the fishes with some artificial feed. This might cause eutrophication in the area. Like this is one reason why they ask LLDA, Laguna Lake Development Authority, to dismantle some of the fish pens in the area because of eutrophication that developed in Laguna de Bay due to too much feeding of the fishes and that eutrophied the area. But in terms of just algae production, I don't see any because they, this is a very healthy method of um, making the aquatic environment more healthy. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Goss. Uh, our next, that's the last question for uh, Professor Goss. Thank you so much. Our next question would be for Engineer Goe. Engineer, Engineer Ivan, are yes. you there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question for you, uh, Engineer, is uh, how do you choose, uh, this is from Professor Noel Sabino from uh, IBS UPLB. Mm -hmm. Do you choose which algal species will serve as the very good source of biofuel? Mm. I think right now, um, among the literature that I found, more um, microalgal species they consider Chlorella vulgaris and, and or spirulina. I think there still need to be a lot of research done on which species to consider in terms of biofuel production. I hope, I hope uh, Professor uh, Noel, that answers your question. Uh, let's see if we have more questions. Okay, next question would be uh, from Lance Sarmiento from IBS UPLB. Do you think ocean uh, acidification is a threat to seaweed farming, especially uh, in seaweed farms located in marine coastal uh, areas. That's for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's for you, ma'am. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. This is for you, ma'am. This is from uh, Lance Sarmiento. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so. Yes. But I think um, when uh, acidification can be really uh, alleviated by growing more algae, wherein the water becomes more basic. See when because of the when water combines with carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid, then you're going to bicarbonate and carbonate, making that water in the area more basic instead of acidic. So if you grow more algae, you will go into a more basic, and that is also optimum for the growth of most algae. Thank you, uh, Dr. Goss. Uh, so I think that's all the question that we have. If you have questions for our speakers, uh, I think uh, Engineer Ge has given his uh, contact number so you can contact and ask questions for him. I think the, the other speakers would love to hear questions from, from participants also. Again, thank you so much for those for our speakers, both in our uh, YouTube and our Zoom chat box. Okay. So I think we're, we're in the, uh, at the end of our webinar. So before we end our webinar for today, let's hear 
it from our PSM our webinar chair, uh, Mr. Christian Jordan de la Rosa. Hello. 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 Loud and clear. Okay. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the PSM would like to thank everyone for actively participating and making this first ever PSM webinar symposium one half successful. One half because we still have another webinar tomorrow. And we hope that we will still see each other tomorrow. We'll still have, if my, if our, if this is correct, we have 277 participants here in Zoom and we have 30 plus participants in our YouTube live streaming. I hope we will see each other again, all 300 plus participants tomorrow. I would like to thank our three speakers for today for responding positively to our sudden invitation for a PSM webinar. As mentioned earlier by our PSM president, Cluster 2 Symposium has been officially canceled. But we tried to compensate and we are able to have this first PSM webinar series. And it was really a short notice, but as I've said, all our six speakers, including our speakers tomorrow, positively responded to our call. I would like to personally thank my PSM family for their support. Allow me to specifically mention Dr. Lucille Villegas, Dr. Noel Sabino, Sir Robbie Vasquez, the moderator, uh, Dr. Donna Papa, Sir Edison Pagoso, Kenneth Ginto, and of course, Bon Datul for helping me managing in the organization of this webinar. Again, we invite everyone tomorrow. We hope we will see each, we see each other again and hopefully in the coming months, we will personally, physically see each other again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sir Jordan. So uh, for your certificates, for our participant certificate, so before you get your certificate for this webinar, you please uh, answer or uh, answer the survey in this uh, here, uh, PSM webinar day one evaluation. So this is only available for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, you cannot uh, answer the survey and then cannot get your certificate. So if you want your certificates, please, please, please answer this evaluation. Okay, so I think this is the end of our webinar. We would like to see you tomorrow on our day two uh, webinar. We have another three uh, great speakers for tomorrow. Okay, so uh, in behalf of the PSM webinar group organizers and the PSM uh, board members, we would, I would like to thank everyone for attending this uh, webinar. So I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Po. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Please answer the survey. Thank you, Paul. Pwede wala tayong group photo? Meron po, ma'am. <laughs> Pasti po muna yung speakers po and board. Thank you po. Thank you, po. Thank you very much. Wag po muna alis yung board. Thank you, everyone. Also for the speakers, please stay. Board members and the speakers. Thank you.
<laughs> Admit yun. Excuse me, sorry.
Hello? Ayan, okay na po ata. Okay na. Po kung na-remove na. Pwede na humatching. Pwede na humatching, Joel. Ha? Pwede na mag-hatching. Oo nga, tukhang agad si Tita Bet. <laughs> Sorry, wala kaming virtual background, ha? Jordan, anong costume bukas? Nasuot na, oh. Oo nga, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Ulit? Eh, isang, dalawang oras lang naman ginamit. Masaya. <laughs> Buti na lang, magpabango ako. Any <laughs> <laughs> PSM shirt? PSM polo shirt? Oo. Uh-uh. Ay, ano yung off yung YouTube lives? So, eh, this, eh, si Kit, nakikita pa tayo sa YouTube, eh. Ay, hindi, hindi ko po alam i-off yun. 